Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. I hope you're doing well. My name is Dave Marshall and I'm your host, and this is episode 102 on small shelly fossils, in which I interview Dr. Marissa Betts of the University of New England in Australia. In the first part of this two-part episode, we cover art student squats, disgusting parties, and the ratification of stages of the earliest Cambrian. In the second part, we get to grips with some of the weird fossil organisms found immediately at the start of the Cambrian period, and Marissa gets haunted by a ghost. But before we jump into the interview, I just wanted to say a big thanks to all those who voted for us in the podcast awards. Unfortunately, we didn't make the top 10 this year, but then again, we decided to swim amongst the bigger fish in the science category, as opposed to the education category in which we were a regular contestant. It really means a lot that you took the time to vote, so that's greatly appreciated. But to our fans, I just wanted to apologise for the late delay in the release of this episode. And within the last few weeks, I had to move house on really short notice to take up a once in a lifetime job opportunity. I'll be able to tell you about it in probably about two years, but until then, just know that I'm doing something that most paleontologists could only dream of, and it's going to be absolutely massive. So the day after we recorded our interview, Marissa travelled out to do field work in Mongolia, and she documented her time in the field on her Instagram account, at 200 micron. So that's at the number 200 and the word micron. So make sure you check out her account and give her a follow. And whilst you're on social media, make sure you're also following us across all the various platforms and like and share everything to help us reach the biggest audience we can. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, Marissa. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Hi. So we want to get to know you before we uh, jump into details about early Cambrian chronostratigraphy. So what was your route into paleontology? How did you become a paleontologist? Um, well, I, I got into paleo a bit later. I wasn't one of those people that um, decide they're going to be a paleontologist at the age of eight. Um, I, after I finished high school, I, um, enrolled in a, a visual arts degree and I, yeah, <laughs> so I was, I never really did science at school. Um, I did a little bit, but, um, at school I was mostly doing, uh, visual art and making things, photography, design. I did, um, technical drawing as well. And so when I finished, I did a, I, I wanted to do more creative visual art stuff um, and I did that for about a year and a half and realized that maybe I wasn't very good <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it just wasn't the right, um, course for me. Um, and it was, mo- it was more about sort of, um, a lot of theory behind, um, fine art. Um, and so maybe what I would have liked more would be something like product design, like, I think that I like making things that people use and um, so it wasn't really the right thing for me and I ended up quitting halfway through. But I did a good like year and a half of this course and I, um, I eventually I quit and then I went travelling for a while and I, I think that um, this training in visual art, we were always sort of told to go to galleries and museums and stuff like this and so when I was travelling, I went, I went and lived in the UK for a little while. Okay, um, whereabouts? Island. Hey? Whereabouts? Um, well, I moved to um, Dublin first. So I was in Ireland for six months, and then I lived in London for a year and a half. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> Didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was there a little while ago. Um, that was like um, 2005, 2006. And so, um, yeah, I mean, London was amazing because there are so many galleries and museums and things to go and see, like, and so I was always every weekend going out and doing that sort of stuff. And um, I would back go back again and again to the Natural History Museum in Kensington. And I found that more and more like the Natural History Museums and Science Museums were like speaking to me more than going to art galleries and things. And I thought, oh, you know, it, 
this sounds like a cool thing to kind of get involved with. And so when I came home back to Australia um, after I after all of that, I wanted to enrol in a, a university course that would sort of help me do something like that. And I eventually um, enrolled in a museum studies degree um, at Macquarie University in Sydney. They, they had this course there about museum studies. And, um, and I liked that one because it was sort of taking it from like a, a natural science perspective rather than a humanities or an arts perspective. Um, and so I did that. And part of that degree was doing, I had to do some geology and biology and stuff. And I just really, I just really like rocks all of a sudden. <laughs> like the, ro <laughs> the rocks really spoke to me. And or maybe it was because like the when I was studying the geology subjects, I met some really cool people and I made lots of good friends doing geology. And I felt like, you know, we would always end up at the pub afterwards, which is pretty classic for studying, <laughs> studying geo subjects. And so, I don't know, we all got along really well. And um, I eventually switched my entire degree over to geology. So I did a, was doing a Bachelor, bachelor of Science. And, um, and then at the end of the degree, pretty much, I kind of counted all up the subjects and I was like, oh, well, if I do, you know, a couple more paleo subjects, I'll get a major in paleo. <laughs> and so I did some subjects with my, who was going to be my future PhD supervisor, Glenn Brock um, at Macquarie University. And um, I ended up, I just really loved those subjects. And I found, I felt like it all just made a lot of sense to me. And um, I actually, I remember at the time, because I was in a geology degree, there was a mining boom, right, in Australia, and everybody was getting like really um, uh, high paid jobs. Like they were getting sort of uh, headhunted before they'd even finished. And I was like, yeah, this is going to be great. Like I'm going to graduate, I'm going to make all this money, it's going to be awesome. And then just as I graduated, the um, mining boom crashed and like there were no jobs and I was like oh no <laughs> and so I thought oh well you know maybe I'll keep studying and because I was really enjoying paleo um I um I just sort of stuck with that and I'd I'd approach Glenn um about doing some more work or volunteering in the lab and he ended up hiring me as a um a lab assistant so I worked for the lab for um quite a while and I saw how his lab was run and um and I really liked the feel in his lab. And so, yeah, I ended up doing an honours project with him, and which was very successful. And um, off the back of that, he offered or suggested that I do a PhD as well. And so that's that that work um, is the chronostratigraphic work um, that we wanted to chat about today. It's crazy to think that back in 2006, I was pretty much like just starting my um, first paleontological MSc and you were living in London as a, like an <laughs> ex-artist traveller. <laughs> yeah, I was living, I, honestly, I was living in um, a squat in, like, <laughs> in zone two. We didn't pay rent or anything. Like it was just like wild times, man. But um. <laughs> Yeah, humble beginnings. <laughs> and and a question that we always ask everyone as well um, is, what would you be doing if you weren't a paleontologist now? And to be honest with you, it sounds like it could be anything. <laughs> yeah. I think, it, you know, often I wonder, like, if I had my time again, and I do, I still love the creative um, side of things, and I still, I make things now, and... Um, I'm a member of the Pottery Club in Armidale where I live. And so I think that if I, like, knowing myself now and I had the time to go back, like, you know, when I quit that art degree, I should have done product design. Like, I should have done something like that, like that where I could make things people use, like designing cool toothbrushes or something like this. Like, I think <laughs> that I would really enjoy that. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, toothbrush toothbrush designer is unique. We've never had that answer before. Oh well. <laughs> Look, we're just getting started. 
getting started here. <laughs> yeah, something else we've never discussed before is uh, the early Cambrian and it's by bi- uh, biostratigraphy, chronostratigraphy, oh, stratigraphy, yeah. chemostratigraphy. No, oh. not really. So why the earliest Cambrian? Why did you start working on fossils from this time opposed to, say, the enigmatic and mysterious fossils, the Rangiomorphs from the Ediacaran period just before, or the outstanding diversity of life just a little bit later, say like the Burgess Shale or Chenjiang. Why the earliest Cambrian? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's it boils down to Glenn Brock, my supervisor at Macquarie. Um, I did um because when I when I suggested to him that I would like to do an honors project. And he, he likes for students to sort of have ownership of their own work. And so he said, go away and think of something that you are interested in and come back. And I said, okay. So I went away and I thought about it and I did like the Ediacara. And I thought, I think that's a really like a super cool, interesting period of time, right? Um, and so I came back and suggested the Ediacara. And Glenn listened to me very carefully and, he, you know, he's nodding and he um, – and, but then he said, uh, because he is like Mr. Small Shelley Fossil in Australia, like he's, you know, working on the early Cambrian of the Flinders Ranges and has done for quite some time. And he listened to me and um, he was nodding and he said, ah, oh, that's that's cool. Have you considered small Shelley fossils? <laughs> and I said, oh, what? Oh, yeah, maybe. Um, and it was it made a lot of sense. Like at the Ediacaran... Um, in Australia and I think maybe elsewhere in the world can be quite hard to break into. I think a lot of people have, you know, um, their sites and their material and it's unless you're working directly with them, it can be very hard to be a new new kid on the block, I guess. Um, and Glenn has had so much experience and success with the early Cambrian in um, South Australia. Um, and... The, the packages of rocks that, that he's been studying in the Flinders Ranges um, and also south of the Flinders, uh, I have to say they're probably some of the, the best in the world. They're the, the thickest packages of early Cambrian limestones that um, you'd like to see. They're beautifully preserved and they're really nicely exposed. Um, so we have a, a really remarkable repository of early Cambrian um, rocks and, and fossils in South Australia. So it's a, it was a bit of a no-brainer, I think, in the end to work on that. I like how you were like, small shelly fossils. It's kind like, of a what? parallel to what our audience is going to go through. They're, they're going to be <laughs> tuning in just like, small shellies, I'm not sure about this interview, but by the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to be um, loving them. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're amazing little things. They really are. <laughs> right. Well, before we get into the details of those, can you tell us what was going on uh, in the earliest Cambrian, both geologically and biologically? Yeah, sure. I mean, the Ediacara, uh, the, the early Cambrian or the Cambrian explosion, as people like to call it, I guess is best understood when we think about it in the context of what was happening before in in the Ediacara in the pre in the Precambrian, and so before the earliest Cambrian, the world was dominated, um, I guess, in terms of the in terms of life, by microbes for something like two billion years. Right, we've had the the Earth dominated by microbial life, and then um, things changed a lot. Um, at the very end of the sort of Precambrian and the Ediacaran, and um, what we see in the fossil record are the the Ediacaran fauna. So this very unique um, uh, soft-bodied fauna, um, but we don't really know. There's some evidence now coming out that they might be related to animals, but they're you know for a lot of them it's very hard to find that evidence that they might actually be directly related to the animals that exist today. Um, and in the the very lowest part of the Cambrian, we do start to see animal life evolve, and it happens very fast, and that's why they call it the Cambrian explosion. Um, and uh, so 
what happens there, we see um, the evolution very suddenly of lots of different types of animal body plans. So mostly bilaterian life, things that are bilaterally symmetrical, and also the advent of uh, complex biomineralization, biomineralized skeletons, um, and also complex um, relationships, ecolo ecological relationships. Uh, so predator-prey relationships for the first time, um, uh, symbioses for the first time. So everything we really understand about modern communities, um, all of that had its roots all the way back down in the early Cambrian. So how important are Lagerstätter, the sites of special preservation or concentration, such as the Burgess Shale or Chen Zhang, in understanding what was going on in the Cambrian? Because surely they provide us the greatest view uh, of what's happening. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, and I mean, the sites of exceptional preservation like the Burgess Shale and the Chengjiang are um, super important for, um, for us to have a, a very special window into early Cambrian and middle Cambrian um, communities um, because they preserve soft structures. So you get lots more information that you normally would from um, things that are biomineralizing, for example. Um, but I guess the, the, the Burgess Shale is uh, of middle Cambrian age. And there's some um, uh, new, there's a new paper that came out actually by John Patterson, who's in the department here at the University of New England. Um, and he looked at uh, trilobites and uh, their evolutionary rates in the early Cambrian to try and tackle this question of how, um, how fast was the Cambrian explosion? Like, was it really an explosion? Because people have been arguing for some time about whether this is just some sort of artifact or way, the way of the way we're reading the fossil record. Um, and the, his results suggested that, well, um, uh, the, the Cambrian explosion was actually quite short and it's probably restricted only to the very early part of the Cambrian and that um, it was over in a burst pretty much and that communities like the Burgess Shale, which is middle Cambrian, even though they contain lots of really crazy critters with really weird body plans, that by that stage the explosion had kind of settled down and what you're actually looking at are snapshots of what are essentially um, modern style ecosystems. Yeah, we've had uh, John on before, Pato. We should, yeah. we should refer to him by his real name. So he better be listening to this. Yeah. So this interview is going to be concerned about the stratigraphy of the earliest Cambrian. So can you start us off from the basics? What is stratigraphy? Yeah, cool. Well, I guess stratigraphy is that a branch or of geological science or geology um, that is concerned with uh, rocks in layers, so the layering of sedimentary rocks usually we're talking about. We can also think about volcanic rocks in this sort of way because a, um, a volcanic eruption can produce ashes that get sandwiched within other sedimentary layers. So stratigraphy is looking at, um, at rock strata. So if you're standing at a cliff, for example, and you can see the sort of bedding in the cliff and the rocks on the bottom are the oldest ones um, and the, they get progressively younger as you work your way to the top. So that's stratigraphy. I like to think of it as, you know, uh, pick up sticks. You've got so many different little sticks overlying each other and knowing which one's at the bottom and which one yeah. overlies the other one. And they might, uh, that's not a good analogy. Well, you know, I, I I sometimes think about stratigraphy or stratigraphic analogies, and I've read one which was like, if every day you read a newspaper and then you chuck it in the corner, um, and then you, every day you read one and chuck it on top of the pile, when you look at the dates on the papers, the papers on the bottom are going to have the oldest dates, and the ones on the top are going to have the youngest dates. Um, and then I thought, I, I, I think about it as well, like sometimes... Um, what was it? Oh, yes. Like my brother used to live in a terrible share house um, <laughs> and they used to have the most disgusting parties and they never cleaned up. 
and I would go and visit and I I would call it the sort of the party stratigraphic detritus, right? And so the, the oldest the oldest crap on the bottom of the floor was from the, the parties that were, you know, longer ago. And the, so all of the crap just kept building up on top of it. <laughs> and so it was the, the, the party stratigraphy detritus. You know what, that, that works so well. <laughs> I want everyone to picture that when they're thinking about what stratigraphy is. Just having this massive party. As well. it is a, yeah, it's a good analogy, you know, it's getting pushed down. <laughs> 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 well that just concerns like the the relative dates and ages of each layer you know that one party came after the other but what about mm -hmm. absolute dating how do you nail down when something actually happened yeah so uh, yeah so i guess we were talking about like the stratigraphy itself and then um you can take that a step further and talk about chronostratigraphy and if you break that word down, chrono is obviously referring to time. Then you've whacked it in front of stratigraphy, which is rock. So it's, you know, time rock. Um, and chronostrat is all about putting some kind of number or date on that system. So I guess, yeah, you were talking about relative ages before that we know like in a pile, the stuff on the bottom is the oldest and, and it gets younger and younger to the top. But like how actually, how old are those layers? And I guess with chronostrat, you can you can talk about the, the relative ages, um, but what you would really like is to put absolute numbers on, on those um, rock layers. In a sedimentary sequence, the only way you can really get hard numbers, the absolute ages, is by doing radiometric um, dating on volcanic ashes. So, you know, you have to be, like, super lucky to be able to get a volcanic ash in the right spot to help you date your system. But, of course, you know, you can't actually date the sedimentary rocks themselves. The, a sandstone, for example, is contained or contains a whole bunch of particles, right? But if you dated those individual grains in a sandstone, you would get the age that that particular grain formed not when it was incorporated into that sandstone layer. So um, we need to combine um, relative dating methods um, like biostratigraphy and chemostratigraphy, which I guess we'll talk about, with those um, absolute dating methods as well. And so all of this stratigraphic data builds up into effectively what is the geological timescale, yeah? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So this is basically these are the well, these are the exact methods that people use to build the geological time scale or, or the chronostratigraphic chart, as it's called. Absolutely. And so the Cambrian's divided. The Cambrian period is divided up into series, and those are further subdivided into different stages. And so, yep. what kinds of events define? each of the stages of the earliest Cambrian? Um, the main method that people use is um, biostratigraphy. So that is looking at um, the stratigraphic ranges of particular fossils. Um, and we can use fossils to help define um, uh, periods of time um, because uh, organisms evolve over time. And so the older um, rocks will have uh, a different group of fossil organisms or fossils in it than a younger group. Um, and so when we um, look at different rocks, and this happens you know, everywhere across the entire time scale, um, if we find a rock and we're not sure about what age it is, if it's got fossils in it, that can be really helpful because they can be diagnostic of a particular time period when it lived a long time ago. And so biostrat is is very important and we, you can use it on a very fine scale um, and that is nowadays supported um, a lot with uh, stable isotope chemostratigraphy so um, uh, we use carbon and oxygen isotopes and how they change over time and we also use radiometric dating so these three different methods uh, we call it the multi-proxy approach um, is used to um, define time, geological time. 
And how does that get incorporated into the geological timescale? Do you say, I found this evidence, can you insert it, please? Yeah, well, it all comes down to, um, you have to publish all of this information, but that that information is kind of then um, dealt with by the International Commission on Stratigraphy, or the ICS. And they're like the big umbrella body and they make working groups that deal with different chunks of the time scale. Um, and it's their working group's responsibility to ratify boundaries that need ratifying. Um, so what happens is that people will publish their data, their biostratigraphic or chemostratigraphic radiometric data, um, and this will be... Um, incorporated into discussions by these working groups and then they end up voting um, on on the boundaries. And everyone gets along absolutely perfectly and they agree <laughs> on every single thing, yeah? Um, no, definitely not. I think the, um, the Cambrian's pretty bad, not for disagreements, but just that we haven't um, really ratified our, all of our boundaries yet. It's The Cambrian is the last... Um, period in the time scale to ratify all the boundaries, although we have had some success recently with the um, Miaolingian and the Wuliwian. So they're the uh, new names for what was called Series 3 and Stage 5. So the things that aren't ratified yet are just called Series 2 or Stage 2, 3 or 4. So we're still to ratify the lower boundaries of those, those particular chunks of time. But I think it's hard. It's harder probably in the Cambrian. I don't want to make excuses for anybody, but it might be harder in the Cambrian because the Cambrian is kind of a special period of time and a lot of the rules that are required to be able to ratify some of these boundaries, you know, that they don't really necessarily work so well in, um, in a world where we're sort of only developing sort of nascent ecosystems like... Um, so, you know, it, it, could, it, it just makes it a little bit more difficult, I think, to be able to do it properly in the early Cambrian. And, and so it's taking a little bit longer. So there's only one global timescale. And so each of the events that would define a series or a stage, that must apply to the whole world, presumably. Or is there any sort of regional variation where this event doesn't really apply here that happens? Um, well, to be able to define each of these chunks of time, we need to be able to agree that they, that we can see evidence of this particular chunk of time in different places. And there is a global time scale, but, um, the faunas, because, um, uh, in the Cambrian and in the world today, you know, there are um, different places in the world where different groups of organisms live, right? And there are these sort of, in the Cambrian, we talk about different realms and um, like there's different trilobite realms. There's an Olinella trilobite realm, which has different kinds of trilobites to the Red Lichia trilobite realm. Um, and uh, there are different kinds of other uh, fossils that lived in different places. And because of that, um, those are the kinds of organisms or the fossils that we need to use to make each of the, the regional schemes. So um, the, the regional scheme in South Australia that we have built contains or is utilising fauna um, that is, isn't seen in other places. But we need to be able to agree that um, a particular boundary occurs in, a, in, two, in two different places and it is the same, we're talking about the same amount of time. That is a very difficult thing to be able to do and it might be that one of the reasons or it is one of the reasons why it's very difficult to ratify the boundaries in the, in the early Cambrian. So animals living or organisms living in one place as opposed to another, we refer to that as endemism? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Okay, and so... Australia has a problem with an endemic uh, fauna, perhaps. Um, are there any other issues with Australia and um, how it fits in with the rest of the world? Why, why is your studies focused on the Cambrian of Australia? 
Well, yeah, so for a long time, I mean, the um, chronostratigraphic work that we have done has been a long time coming. Um, and um, I guess before this work came out, it was very difficult to put the um, lower Cambrian of Australia into any kind of global chronostratigraphic context because we didn't have any way of, you know, relative dating of, the, of our um, early Cambrian or the lower Cambrian rock sequences. Um, there were these sort of um, uh, ideas about trilobites in Australia being um, hugely diachronous in that they their, their appearance in South Australia was apparently much later than everywhere else in the world. Um, and we do have uh, a very um, strong endemic fauna as well. Um, although now we can see more and more when we've studied a lot of the, the Shelley fauna that have come out of the Lower Cambrian rocks in South Australia, we can see that we can do quite a lot of species level, but mostly genus level correlations with other places. So we're doing a lot better than maybe has been previously appreciated. So that's a lot of things to consider when you're trying to divide up the Cambrian. Um, how much work was this? <laughs> Well, um, my PhD project, which this was a part of, was a 3.5-year gig, um, but it built on over a decade, maybe 15 years of work of my supervisor and his students and colleagues. So I guess Glenn understood that Australia had a problem in terms of being able to um, integrate ourselves into a global chronostratigraphic context, but he also appreciated how much work needed to be done to be able to get to this point. And so what that required was extensive amounts of field work and collection. Um, and on top of that, huge amounts of um, describing of the faunas that are coming out of it. So what what we what you really need to be able to do something like this is to build the scheme on um, robust and reliable taxonomy. So you know it, it, the the fact that most of the work um, or a lot of this has been built on papers that were published within the last ten years or so means that we have a really good um, base to build a chronostratigraphic scheme. So it sounds like you're getting a pretty good handle on the biostratigraphy on the whole. Um, so why do you need the stuff with chemostratigraphy, the isotopes? Yeah, okay. So um, we do have a really good handle on the South Australian Shelley fauna that we use for the biostratigraphy. Um, or, but the, the scheme that we built... We, we built it on, and we had to do this based on the fauna that we had, some of the key um, fossils for each of our zones are endemic. They're only found in South Australia uh, or maybe also Antarctica because in the Cambrian, Australia, Antarctica were very close neighbours. and So we share a very um, similar uh, fossil fauna. Um, so because we're, we have a scheme that is built largely on endemic fauna, it's very difficult to be able to correlate that with other places in the world, so other early Cambrian or lower Cambrian terrains around the world. So what you're looking for is a, some way to get a global signal or a global proxy for time. And um, what uh, is widely used are stable isotopes or carbon isotopes. Um, so that can, if you look at the, the change in, um, in carbon isotopes over time, that can give you a, a proxy for, for time that is seen all around the world. And what's actually changing there? What, what's controlling the, the different isotopes of carbon? And, and where do you even find them? <laughs> yeah, so the carbon isotopes that we're looking at are carbon-12 and carbon-13. Um, and um, carbon-12, because it's a bit lighter, is um, more uh, preferentially utilised by organisms in their sort of metabolic processes because organisms are lazy and so they want to use the easy one. So they, they go for the lighter isotope. And so when you have um, times where you get a lot of productivity, there's a lot of um, organisms using up that lighter isotope and so you, it means you get more carbon-13 in the system and that gets buried. So you end up with these sort of peaks and troughs 
um, in a, a curve, a global carbon isotope curve that's telling you about um, productivity essentially in the ocean. And because the oceans are actually relatively well mixed, so you, we can, you can mix the ocean on a thousand year time scale or something like this, um, that means that you should be able to record that, uh, that signal everywhere. And, you know, on a geological time scale, that's more or less instantaneous. And so what process do you use to obtain this data? To get the carbon isotope data, well, what we did is, um, and what's widely applied in this sort of circumstances, what's called bulk rock. So because the, um, the isotopes are in the seawater, the carbon isotopes are in the seawater, that can be precipitated directly out of solution in limestones. Um, the rocks that we're looking at are carbonates, limestones. So we drill small amounts of rock powder um, and we get that analysed. And so that can give us um, an information, information about the, um, the isotopic values in ancient seawater. How reliable is this chemostratigraphic data? Excellent question. And it is, I think that it's, it's right to be suspicious um, or at least, um, yeah, to err on the side of caution when using um, isotopic data for chemostratigraphy and correlation. I think that maybe there's been a bit too much made of relying on it almost solely as a temporal proxy um, for for correlating stratigraphic sections. Um, because, and the issue is, is that um, there are lots of things that could have happened to your isotopes and your rocks since the, since the rock was made. You know, in the Cambrian, we're talking about something like 500 million years of geologic history. And so, you know, um, it, all sorts of things could have um, changed the, the ratios of the isotopes, diagenetic processes, fluids running through the rocks, weathering, things like that. So you need to be extremely careful when you are sampling that you are getting uh, rocks that haven't been altered or have been altered as little as possible. Um, uh, carbon isotopes are a lot more resistant than oxygen isotopes. And the oxygen isotopes are, are almost always used in tandem with the carbon. And so the oxygen can sometimes tell you whether something has happened to your rock. And so that can help you be critical of, of what's happening in the, in the carbon. Um, so, you know, and there's also people who work in the modern day are very critical of um, using carbon isotopes um, in deep time because they can see that in the modern day that there are different values for um, isotopes in different parts of the ocean, you know, in shallow water versus deep water versus empiric system versus open ocean. Um, and so, uh, you know, that translates into, you know, how could you possibly rely on um, isotopes as a global signal in deep time. But those sorts of um, ideas um, maybe don't account for time averaging, which is really important in um, deep time sort of studies. Um, and the fact remains that there does seem to be a very strong and very consistent um, carbon isotope curve in the lower Cambrian. And so it's a, it's a matter of sort of working with what we've got. <laughs> That sounds like a lot of work to figure that one out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, how difficult has it been to get your head around uh, working with all this chemical data as an artist, as a geologist, <laughs> and now a chemist? Yeah, I remember being quite intimidated by doing this, but it was my idea, actually. So the, the, at the beginning, my PhD project was essentially just about the fauna um, and, um, and doing the biostratigraphy. But as I carried on and I did more reading, you know, I sort of thought, you know, we really need to be able to, and I realised that our fauna and the ones that were really important for our biostrat were endemic. And I thought, well, as not, what can I do, you know, to put this in the world, in the global scheme, you know? And I, I approached Glenn and I said, I think we need to try and use um, isotopes. And Glenn was from the other side at the time and he said, that's crap and it doesn't work. <laughs> and I, I thought, well, I, I don't know really yet, so, but maybe we should try it, right? 
And so we did give it a go. Um, and when I first started, I was I was terrified of contaminating my samples and how to um, process them and um, how to interpret the data and stuff like this and, and what had happened to my rocks. Like I was, I was so, I was getting in um, uh, way, like way deep into the diagenetic history of all of my samples and trying to work out what had happened to them and how that could possibly have wrecked the isotopic values. Um, and so I did lots of thin section analyses. I actually got like really into um, carbonate petrography um, and petrology. I really enjoyed that. Um, but, you know, I realised that, you know, to be able to quantify the diagenetic pathways of every one of the samples that we did from all 21 stratigraphic sections, you know, um, would have been, you know, two or three extra PhDs. And so what I realised then is that actually you just have to sort of, a lot of people kind of go for it um, without doing any kind of screening work. Um, but the, we were quite critical of, of our samples before we even started. And so the results actually were quite good after I worked out what I was looking at. <laughs> so we saw that there was some um, uh, quite a strong relationship between what was happening in the in the isotopes and what was happening in the biostrat. So at you know at a particular boundary between two biostratigraphic zones, we were always seeing you know positive values or a, a curve to the positive, for example. So that sort of relationship was happening again and again, and that was sort of enough for us to think that yeah, they were probably it's probably a real signal. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin-Silverstone and Caitlin Colary. It was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast and like us at facebook.com forward slash Paleocast to get all the latest news. Coming soon in the next episode. Let's turn our attention now to the biostratigraphy. We're, we're Paleocast, we should be talking about fossils. Well, that's a good question. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of the life's work of, of many paleontologists. Oh, it sounds complicated. It sounds like a lot of work. Oh, yes. <laughs> No, Dave, do not scare me like that. <laughs> For sure, nobody is here. Nobody is here. <laughs>